Hey, good morning, everybody. Nice to have you in Nashville. Uh, uh, Joe, Richard, and I came a little bit earlier. We went to the Grand uh, uh, Opera House the other day, and uh, we had that twilight moment zone because we heard this song about this uh, truck driver who lo uh, whose girlfriend walked away with his uh, uh, calculator manual that PPC issued. <laughs> but okay, uh, we uh, right place, wrong universe. Anyway, <laughs> so. Uh, my first, this is the first of two talks about optimization uh, using the HP Prime. Uh, it's a big credit for the calculator to be able to do this because these programs are by no means short. And I always started implementing them in Excel and then translating them. I have a program that helps me to do the uh, chores systematic uh, conversion into Prime and then of course I run them on the Prime. Uh, I would like to dedicate this talk to Felix Gross. This is a picture of me and Felix in a, 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 a Middle Eastern Museum in Berlin in May. And uh, he invited uh, me and my wife to, and we got to a hotel 10 minutes away from where he lives, and we had a ball, the Ishtar Gate. Uh, that's the Babylon. Yeah, yes. And that's yeah. the real thing. That's, that's the real thing, and oh. ISIS can't get to it. Isn't it, it, that right? Yeah. So. A lot of my friends says, yes, we were glad all these German and French and British took our stuff and protected it, you know. <laughs> uh, genetic algorithms is a, is a, a search heuristic that imitates a process of natural selection. And we normally refer to it by its abbreviation GA. And uh, GA belongs to a, a, a bigger category of evolutionary algorithms. And it was developed by John Holland in the 60s, who was uh, a professor at the University of Michigan, Go Blue. And it was popularized by his student, uh, David E. Goldberg, who wrote one of the first uh, books on genetic algorithms and included a generous amount of Pascal code. I have a book, and it's uh, it's good if you ever are hurting for code, that's a good place to start, although there's a lot of other stuff in different languages implemented uh, for GA. Uh, just a quick show, uh, look at the list of evolutionary algorithms. You have simulated annealing, genetic algorithms itself, differential algorithm, uh, ant colony, um, particle swarms, and many others. And uh, the variance of these algorithms because each algorithm has several steps and different researchers would tweak the, each step differently so you have an explosion of variance of these algorithms. What evolutionary algorithms are different from classical is that classical al uh, 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 optimization algorithms can easily get stuck in a local uh, 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 minima or, or maxima while the evolutionary algorithms have all in common is that while they are near an, a minima or maxima, they're keeping an eye out for a global minimum or maximum. So that's their advantage. Um, the, the math in general is much simpler than classical algorithms and they are very effective and they are smart. It doesn't mean that they don't also get stuck in a local minimum but they do a much better job in searching out for uh, different possibilities. That's really the main difference between evolutionary algorithms and classical optimization algorithms. Um, GA has its own parlance, so to speak. It has its own terms because it mimics uh, 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 genetic mutations. So it uses genes to represent variables. So a gene is a variable. And then it uses chromosomes which is made up of several genes to represent a, a, a data point. And each variable ha is based on a, a sequence of binary digits. This is if you're looking at uh, GA from a purist standpoint. We will talk about variations on that later on. And the binary digits are usually mapped on a range of real values. And so you have a routine that always takes the current zeros and ones and translate them into uh, the real number that they fall in. Uh, there's a fitness function, which represents the function uh, that you want to optimize, either minimize or maximize. And then 
the values of the uh, function at different points, different chromosome values, are called cost functions. So these are the, the different, uh, you know, where you're probing to see how you're doing. Um, also, GA uses a population which corresponds to a number of probes. You launch a number of probes, 50, 100, whatever, to look for the, the optimum. And it uses a number of generations that simply represent the number of iterations. So you have a thousand generations. You're going to try a thousand times to evolve these uh, 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 chromosomes in, uh, in search of the optimum. Uh, now, uh, when you program something like Excel or uh, the prime and you're, and you're storing zeros and ones in, in the matrices, you're going to say, well, why stick to zeros and one? Why not uh, go all the way, do zero through nine? Uh, and it, it seems like a good idea because, wow, you can have huge integers, large integers that are comfortably represent mapping uh, the, the, the uh, r real values uh, for, for your continuous functions. Uh, now, that seems like a good idea. The problem is actually the binary digits, uh, the variation in binary digits can cover quickly a wider range of values than using uh, 0 through 9. So the 0 through 9 scheme, which I tried, uh, actually struggles uh, in, in getting to the uh, global optimum value. So, uh, uh, GA has, these are uh, some general steps. I'm going to go first with the general steps and then with an example, uh, shed some more details. You initialize your population of chromosomes with random value. Also, you can have the, chromo uh, the children replace only those population members that are less fit. But this adds complexity because now, you have to uh, sort, um, uh, uh, find the, the cost function of the children and sort them out and then kind of compare two lists and all that. Uh, it, uh, it's good, but it takes a lot of work. And uh, I found it not necessarily, it's a nice idea, but I did not implement it in, in, uh, in the code. Uh, now, um, after you've done the mating and you have new children, you selectively mutate mm -hmm. the updated chromosomes. Uh, and this kind of gives, that allows uh, the search to locate values out there that may actually be close to the global optimum. This is the way for the algorithm to kind of keep an eye on what's out there that might be better. Yeah. What we nor I normally do is uh, you can shield the elite because if you don't, you may lose your best points uh, in searching for the global optimum. So usually there's a number of chromosomes that you shield them from the mutation. Uh, let's say it's like five, the best five elements, you just keep them, you know, and you mutate uh, the, the rest. And then you repeat uh, step uh, two to five for a specific number of generations, or if you have a criteria, if the function is as low as whatever and you're happy with that, then you can stop. Now, how do we initialize? This is sort of more an in-depth on the, on the general process. Uh, we have, first, we have to specify how many bits we're going to use to represent each gene, each variable. And then, of course, we specify the range of each variable. And this helps uh, the search not to run away you know, uh, beyond uh, uh, points of interest. And then we create a matrix of binary digits of Boolean. Uh, when I was uh, coding in Excel, I used Booleans, but when I switched to the prime, I was using a, a matrix of uh, uh, numbers that I filled with zeros and ones. Uh, so the number of rows equal the population size, how many probes you have. But the number of columns equals the number of variables times the number of bits. So if I'm using, searching, uh, my problem has four variables, and I have, say, 15 bits, that's 16 columns I have. So the, the matrix usually is huge. And this is what really allowed uh, me to think that maybe the prime can do that because it had enough memory to accommodate that uh, population, mat uh, mm -hmm. population matrix. And then, of course, you have your matrix uh, the dimension, and you set each element to 0 and 1 using a random number generator. And if it's like above, five, uh, above half, you set a one if 
and otherwise you, you keep it at a zero. Now here's an example. I have a chromosome with n genes, and e genes has a random number of a sequence of zeros and ones. Here's an example of eight chromosomes and their cost functions. Okay. So these are the cost functions. They're not arranged in, uh, in any uh, particular order. The next step is to sort the function values. Uh, after uh, we calculate the function values for each uh, of the chromosomes, we sort them out. Usually the method I use, I use an intermediary um, index array to postpone shuffling uh, the chromosome values and post until the very end. This way you go f uh, much faster, especially if you have uh, a, a large uh, number of population like 500. Uh, <coughs> difficult problems require larger uh, uh, populations. Now here is the uh, uh, chromosome sorted with the cost function from lower to upper. We have eight, and as I said, we take the first half, the first four uh, 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 as parents. So we select uh, uh, the best pairs, uh, you know, uh, of chromosomes, uh, starting with the fittest, of course. Uh, there are several methods to do that. Literature uh, 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 advocates a roulette selection by rank or function value uh, by, by rank of function or uh, uh, post-sorting uh, rank. Their, uh, their thinking is you don't want to get stuck with the elite because you may end up uh, prematurely zooming in on a local uh, optimum uh, and, and miss the, the global optimum. Um, I found a method where I could randomly select fitted chromosome uh, using the inverse uh, Gaussian distribution. I'll explain this uh, this way, you, uh, my thinking is you ca you're picking um, randomly among the elite, not sticking to the very, very elite, but you can kind of wander away a little bit from the top because I figured, well, I didn't have much faith in focusing on using uh, unfit uh, elements. Now, the roulette selection is what you do. You calculate the uh, x-axis. You take the, you accumulate the sums uh, of uh, x, where x is either the rank uh, or function value, and you develop the curve like this. Uh, and then uh, you generate a random number between 0 and 1, and then that tells you which uh, index, which element to pick. <laughs> um, the test that I've done uh, did not give me impressive uh, re results, but the literature seems to swear by it. <coughs> The inverse Gaussian selection method that I uh, developed is I figured I really need to select in this. First of all, the inverse Gaussian will give you in, uh, 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 values in the negative. Of course, there are no negative indices. So what I do, I fold the shaded part on the positive by taking the absolute value. But then I end up with indices starting from zero and on. Of course, the HP prime does not take an index zero, so I simply add one, I shift everything. But this will give me a chance to randomly select among the better, the, the top echelon. Uh, so here's an example. We have picked the, the f best four uh, uh, chromosomes. And we made the parents, depend uh, depending on which algorithm we want, we select uh, random crossovers. So, uh, so if you do the same iterations and you happen to be using the same parents, at least you get different children. So each uh, two parents uh, give you two children. And this is an example where we're mating certain chromosomes uh, and then creating, you know, uh, deciding who's the, who's the mother, the, f the father, and then the binary digits. And we take one part from the mother, one part from the father, and create the chromosomes for the children. Uh, after uh, creating the new uh, generation, we look at the non-elite chromosomes and we test for possibility for each digit whether we're, running, uh, we're going to mutate it or not. And when we compare each, each digit in the chromosome, 
uh, we have a mutation rate and we compare that with a uniform random number and we decide whether we can, we can flip the digit or not. And some people, uh, I use sometimes just half, some people use a low mutation rate so they preserve more the, the chromosomes as they are. And this is an example where we have a digit here. This one we flip it and it becomes a zero. Uh, so here's the new generation. Uh, the, this column shows you the population after mating, the zeros and one, after mutation and then the new cost. And that would be the end of one, one generation, uh, one iteration, and then you start all over again. Uh, how do we enhance GA? There are many ways to do that, and I've incorporated that in the HP Prime code. Uh, first of all, there's a, the most obvious variant is to handle continuous numbers rather than binary digits. That speeds up calculation enormously. And the good news is that actually also enhances uh, the performance of the algorithm. Uh, what you can do also, you can initialize the first half of the population and then select the second half to have complementary values. So this way you cover a wide range of values rather than possibly having clustering in, in one area. So that's a, that's a good technique. Yeah. Now you can also allow a, a mating of parents to generate a litter of three or more children and then just pick the best two. And this way you keep, so two parents will reproduce three or more. I use five, for example, in the uh, HP Prime code, but I pick the, the best two, so I keep my population uh, uh, constant. And we can, of course, select the mating uh, uh, a crossover point at random. Uh, uh, we can also select two crossover points. So we're we're taking, uh, you know, more combinations of the chromosomes from each parent. And better yet, there is a, a, another technique where we use a random bit mask, and that tells me which chromosome from either parent goes to either children. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's also very effective. And the other one is allowing of mating of multiple parents, polygamy or hyperpolygamy, to produce a litter of children and baby tick. So it's funny because uh, GA is supposed to imitate, you know, life, but this is kind of, you know, pushing it further. And I've seen it in the literature, uh, and of course has some uh, reactions. <laughs> <laughs> so Freud doesn't like it. Not only Freud, I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, even even uh, uh, Cyril didn't like it. You know, that was in Chicago. So uh, we can also include a um, local optimum uh, using hill climbing algorithm method incorporated. And this enhances GA and it transforms it into what we call memetic algorithm. And uh, it's based on the memes theory. So memetic algorithm is the survival of the fittest who is more informed. We are basically a memet uh, uh, memes theorist. We enhance ourselves by sharing information. So, uh, and we can uh, uh, put the hill climbing method at various parts, we can enhance the entire population at the start of each iteration. Uh, we can enhance the parents, the selective parents before mating. We can enhance the children before mutation. We can enhance the mutated population or any combination. And keep in mind, hill climbing, you're adding somewhat more CPU time because it's a, it's a, it's a local search, you know, but it does enhance things. Uh, And we can use mask, uh, masking with several of the previous mating selection method. A mask is a binary logical filter uh, that uh, toggles the, the uh, parents' chromosome values. And we can allow GA to restart if uh, early uh, convergence occurs. What we do is we watch the number of iterations where there's no improvement, and we have a limit. And if it reaches that limit, then we just 
uh, uh, trigger a new uh, search for a new population. And then there are other techniques. Now, test functions, the one I use the most, and there's a lot of them, we'll talk about this very soon, is the Rosenbrock. And it's a summation. And uh, most books use two variables, but I use four. Interesting, if you look at this equation, it goes from 1 to n minus 1. The first and last, uh, uh, x of 1 and x of n, only contribute once to the summation. All other uh, variables contribute twice. And I've noticed that if I add to this function value, this expression tying up x of n and x of 1, uh, the Rosenbrock becomes more symmetrical because then each variable contributes to the summation twice. It's uh, more symmetrical, easier to solve, but then again, um, kind of defeats the purpose because you're supposed to use a tough equation. But if you use the symmetrical function and you can't get a solution, then you're really in trouble because that's much easier. Uh, another, uh, two other popular methods that I've seen, the sphere function where you just calculating sum of squares and the, uh, the, the optimum value is at zero. Uh, even simpler versions of those calculate the absolute values and add them and uh, the optimization is, uh, the optimum is at x of i all zero. This is the Rosenbrock function, the way it looks uh, uh, in 2D, and the, the optimum is here somewhere. Uh, and there's the Akeley function. Uh, this is part of a family of functions that use a cosine. And what uh, makes me feel very surprised, they give it such a wide initial range, uh, you know, you can have zeros in sine and cosine in so many locations. Uh, I don't know why they expect it to zoom in on, on a particular uh, uh, result. This is the Akeley function. As you can see, it has a lot of local uh, minima, and the, the global is here at zero, zero. Uh, and the sphere, this, the sphere function for 3D, as it looks, and the optimum is at zero, zero. And this is the uh, sum of absolute values, as you can see, because it's just absolute values. There's no curvature; just it's a shape with, with the a, a straight uh, surface. Now, Namir, these graphs came from where? Uh, I develop, uh, developed them on MATLAB. Okay. Yeah, I wrote them. I did not want to violate copyright people by copying stuff. I just programmed it, gave me this. I took a snapshot. Yeah. Was that but short afternoon. Yeah. Uh, these, the, here's a set of difficult test functions. You have the tripod, alpine, and the rest. The book, Particle Swarm Optimization by Clerk, talks about these. Uh, and then you have more test functions, Beale, uh, Goldstein, Price, and so on. And uh, the, this the URL on Wikipedia lists those. And I've done one step better. I've included a PDF file that has 175 test functions. All kind, they give you the recommended initial range and the expected optimum for those. What I thought was strange is that in a lot of these tests, they expect the, the, all the variables to have the same value. And I've used uh, uh, some calculations in uh, chemical reaction chains um, two or recently even more, I found a formula that gives me how to calculate the chain reaction in as many uh, reactions as I want. And I would set the, the parameters to have different magnitudes, you know, uh, just to see if it can, you know, it can really find these uh, uh, variation and if it discriminates in favor of any variable uh, against uh, another one. Um, now the HP Prime code, HP is the first handheld calculator that can implement GA. So it's a tremendous credit for the machine, because uh, especially the GA code is not short. So it's a, it's, uh, there's a lot of code and a lot of memory uh, uh, that it uses. Uh, I use two functions, GA and GA continuous, to implement the basic methods uh, GA with the uh, most of the enhancements that I discussed. Uh, and uh, GA and GA can't have the exported function, my function, coded. Uh, when you get the code, it has a code for the Rosenbrock function. Simply edit it, 
if you want to test another function. And the GA has the following parameters, uh, number of variables, number of bits uh, per variable, the population size, the number of data points you want to start to use to probe for the optimum, uh, the number of iterations, maximum number of generation, and then the number of elite members, and then the mutation rate, and then the number of no improvement iteration that cause a restart. So if you feel it's stuck, uh, to, to, to the litter size, number of uh, children that the parents produce, from which you take the, the best two. And then the mating mode, I'll explain this later on. And then two arrays that specify the lower and upper range for each variable. The mating mode is uh, pretty much, I decided not to give you, impose on you just the simplest. So number one is the simplest sequential of pairing. So you take first parent with second parent, first chromosome with second chromosome, third with fourth, and so on. That's very simple and works well. Uh, Rank-based selection. Then there's the normal distribution rank uh, using the inverse Gaussian that I explained. Then there's the roulette uh, uh, method selection, the one that the uh, literature recommends. Uh, and then I uh, thought of one mixing, mate, uh, mix, mixing mating where you have and you pick an elite mate, and then the other one is at random, and that does actually okay. And I think the spirit of GA is to avoid being stuck with only the elite uh, chromosomes, uh, to avoid being stuck in a, in a local uh, optimum. Then uh, six to 10 is the above methods uh, using masking, and then the number 11 is the three parent mating. And uh, here's a sample call, I'm calling GA, uh, I'm solving the Rosenbrock with four variables, each with 32 bits per variable. I have 40 chromosomes, 40 points to probe for the optimum. Um, my number of generations is 1,000. That's how many times I'm iterating. And I have uh, five elite members. Muta mutation rate is half. You can lower it if you want. And I restart after 200 iterations of no improvement. <coughs> Mating index, I just decided to use the simple uh, technique. And then the last two variables are the arrays that define the lower and upper bounds. And then there's a sample call. I store uh, the result in matrix M3. And I'm looking at it. It's, it's OK. It, the optimum values are at 1. So uh, I've noticed with the Rosenbrock, always the first variable is closest to the actual result. The second variable is a little bit further, and so on. I don't know regardless of the methods. Um, um, and this is the, uh, uh, the continuous version where I'm not using binary digits. I'm using uh, uh, straight out uh, uh, real values. Same number of variables. And the results are a little bit better, actually. They go above one a little bit. Uh, so you can notice that the continuous version is a little bit better than the uh, binary digits that's uh, straight. Uh, here's a reference. Uh, reference. Uh, Clever Algorithms. Uh, it's a book by uh, Jason Brownlee, and uh, he has put the entire book uh, on, on the web. So you can download it for free as a PDF or look at it as HTML. And he includes uh, explanation of various algor uh, evolutionary algorithms. He gives brief pseudocode, but then he gives you a detailed programs in Ruby. And he's a very good Ruby programmer. So I try to, I'm in the process of translating the Ruby programs in MATLAB. It's not always easy. Most of his examples, actually, he solved the traveling salesman problem. And, you know, uh, uh, but some of them, he just uses the sum of uh, uh, squares, the sphere uh, uh, problem. What's the runtime? <laughs> Uh, about uh, <laughs> about a minute and a half, you know. It's, uh, you know, because it's doing a lot of number commissions. Can't applause. <laughs> yes. Applause. Yeah. Anyway, well, no need. Please, please. <laughs> oh, I did have a question. Yes. I want to wait till you finish. Your mutation rates in this algorithm. Is there's a mortality rate involved in mutations. Something like 99.9% .9 of all mutations are lethal. 
how does that fit into your mutation rate? What are you using as a lethal? Or is all your mutation living and just changing the cost? They, they, yeah, that's what okay. they Okay, yeah. thank you. The, the point of the mutation is to probe impossible areas, oh sorry, in areas um, uh, where we can find a global, uh, just in case we're stuck in a local, you know. Okay. Thank you.